the popes are not without their own sense of humor. Over a century ago, Pope Leo XIII, in his encyclical on the Holy Spirit, bemoaning the ignorance of the faithful concerning the Holy Spirit, wrote the following words. Perchance there are still to be found among Christians, even nowadays, some who, if asked, as were those of old by St. Paul the Apostle, whether they have received the Holy Spirit, might answer in like manner, we have never even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. The Holy Father then goes on to apply a remedy to this ignorance, just as back then there was ignorance about God and the Holy Spirit, so there is still today. The remedy, the Holy Father goes on and says, for this reason, all preachers and those who have care of souls should remember that it is their duty to instruct their people more diligently and more fully about the Holy Spirit. What should be chiefly dwelt upon and clearly explained is the multitude and greatness of the benefits which have been bestowed and are constantly bestowed upon us by this divine giver, so that errors and ignorance concerning matters of such importance may be entirely dispelled as unworthy of the children of light. Pope Leo XIII. This is precisely what we'll try to do today in the little time that we have. We'll look at who the Holy Spirit is and at his gifts which he bestows upon us. Who is the Holy Spirit then? To understand who he is, we have to go back to our catechisms and we'll look at the Baltimore Catechism and brush up on our theology of the Trinity. We know that there is but one God. By revelation, we know that in God there are three divine persons, really distinct, really distinct one from the other, but equal in all things, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is the first person of the Holy Trinity. The Son is the second person of the Holy Trinity, and the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity. The Catechism explains first, second, and third do not mean that one person was before the other or is greater than the others. All persons of the Trinity are equal in every respect. All three are God. The numbers, first, second, and third, refer to the order in which one proceeded from the other. What does that mean? This means that the Father generates the Son in the Holy Trinity, and the Son is begotten by the Father. And the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son. The Son proceeds, as the theologians say, by way of the intellect, the Spirit by way of the will. In the language of the Father is then the Holy Spirit, proceeding by way of the will, the divine will, is a gift of love between the Father and the Son. If you look at the Gospels, when our Lord speaks of the Holy Spirit, he never calls it his own Spirit. The Father never says that the Spirit is his own and his alone. The Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and of the Son. The Council of Florence, let's go back 600 years. The Council of Florence in 1438 explains, this is a bit dense, then we'll try to simplify it. The church teaches, the Holy Spirit is eternally from the Father and the Son. He has his nature and subsistence at once from the Father and the Son. He proceeds eternally from both as from one principle and through one spiration. And since the Father has through generation given to the only begotten Son everything that belongs to the Father, except being Father, the Son has also eternally from the Father, from whom he is eternally born, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son. The Holy Spirit is a gift of love between Father and the Son. And St. Augustine explains, if the love by which the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father ineffably demonstrates the communion of both, what is more suitable than that he should be specially called love, who is the Spirit common to both, once again, the Holy Spirit in the Trinity is that love that unites Father and Son. And the good news is that that same Holy Spirit has been given to us. God makes this gift of love to us. He bestows upon us the Holy Spirit and his gifts. Our Lord says in the Gospel of St. John, I will ask the Father and he will give you another paraclete that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not nor knows him, but you shall know him because he shall abide with you and shall be in you. The Holy Spirit then is given to us 
as a gift of love from God, a gift of love that unites us to God, that unites us to Father, to the Son, and makes us possess the Holy Spirit. It's that gift of sanctifying grace which makes us adoptive children of God. And the Holy Spirit, on his part, gives us his gifts, gifts that strengthen us in the state of grace, gifts that strengthen us in that love for God, that make us love God above all things and all things in God and for God alone. What are these gifts of the Holy Spirit? There are seven of them. Again, let's go back to the catechism. Let's refresh our memories from our childhood. What are the gifts? Understanding, wisdom, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. All of these strengthen us in grace. The gift of the fear of the Lord fills us with a dread of sin. Piety makes us love God as a father and obey him because we love him. Knowledge enables us to discover the will of God in all things. Fortitude strengthens us to do the will of God in all things. Counsel warns us of the deceits of the devil and of the dangers to salvation. Understanding enables us to know more clearly the mysteries of faith. Wisdom gives us a relish for the things of God and directs our whole life and all our actions to his honor and his glory. These are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. But the greatest of all of them, the one to which all these gifts, all seven of them, are ordered and subordinated, is the same gift that the Holy Spirit is between Father and Son, and that is love, charity. St. Alphonsus, Bishop and Doctor of the Church says, we know by faith that the Holy Spirit is the love that the Eternal Father and the Eternal Word bear one another, and therefore the gift of divine charity which the Lord infuses into our souls and which is the greatest of all gifts, in particular attributed to the Holy Spirit as St. Paul teaches. The charity of God is poured forth into our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given to us. And St. Augustine says the same thing, and these are important words. They teach us the importance of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but which, which is the greatest of them. St. Augustine says, and this was back in the fifth century, I quote, there is no gift of God more excellent than this, love. It alone distinguishes the sons of the eternal kingdom and the sons of eternal perdition. Other gifts too are given by the Holy Spirit, but without love, they profit nothing. Unless therefore the Holy Spirit is so far imparted to each as to make him one who loves God and his neighbor, he is not removed from the left hand to the right nor is the Spirit especially called the gift unless on account of love. And he who has not this love, though he speak with the tongues of men and angels, is sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And though he have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and though he have all faith so that he can remove mountains, he is nothing. And though he bestow all his goods to feed the poor, and though he give his body to be burned, it profits him nothing. There is no gift of God more excellent than this. It alone distinguishes the sons of the eternal kingdom from the sons of eternal perdition. But at this point, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, what do we mean when we say love and we say charity? We are not talking about emotions here. The Holy Spirit doesn't always fill us with intense, intense feelings of love for God, ecstatic feelings or emotions. No, the true love of the Holy Spirit is the theological virtue of charity. And what is that? It's the love of God above all things, above ourselves, above our sinful inclinations, and love of all things, of all persons, our neighbors, even our enemies, in God and for God alone. A love that does the will of God even at its own expense. A love that makes us do the works of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul warns us today in the letter to the Galatians, his theology is very simple. He says, those who live according to the flesh are intent on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the spirit, those who live according to the spirit are intent on those of the spirit. And here we're not being abstract. St. Paul is very concrete. What are the works of the flesh? They are obvious, immorality, impurity, lust, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of fury, acts of selfishness, dissensions, factions, occasions of envy, drinking bouts, orgies, and the like. The flesh, with its works, is at enmity with God, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. 
St. Paul says. Instead, what are the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the kind of love that the Holy Spirit gives us, a love that does the works of the Spirit. Other gifts, too, are given by the Holy Spirit, but without this love, they profit nothing. For whosoever are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So we must pray and beseech the Holy Spirit to come and to bestow his gifts upon us, especially the gift of love of God and neighbor. And how do we do this? Final uh, stage of this little reflection. How do we obtain the Holy Spirit? How can we lead? How can we be led by him? Well, when a man and a woman get married, it is a beautiful custom for a wife to take the name of her husband. Two people go by one name. Husband and wife go by the name of the husband alone. For example, Mr. and Mrs. John Smith. They, why? It's for a good reason. They lead one life together, indissolubly united until death, do them part. Two persons, two spouses, go by the same name because of the inseparable unity of their lives. What does this have to do with anything that we're talking about? What does it have to do with the homily? Well, when Our Lady appeared to St. Bernadette in Lourdes, she revealed her own name. She said to St. Bernadette, I am the Immaculate Conception. St. Maximilian Mary Colby, reflecting on these words, discovered that Our Lady bears the same name as her spouse, the Holy Spirit. How is this? Why do both bear the same name? Very simply, in a nutshell, the Holy Spirit, St. Maximilian teaches, is conceived by the love the Father and the Son bear each other. He is, of course, without sin because he's God. He is the uncreated Immaculate Conception. What about Our Lady? Our Lady is conceived by the love that God bears for humanity. She is without sin because she is preserved by God from sin. She is the created Immaculate Conception. Both bear the same name because both are inseparable. That's why St. Maximilian says, the Holy Spirit will not send down a single grace, the Father through the Son, and the Holy Spirit will not send supernatural life on the soul without the mediatrix of all graces. St. Louis de Montfort teaches the same thing. When the Holy Spirit, her spouse, finds Mary in a soul, he hastens there and enters fully into it. He gives himself, because he is a gift, he gives himself generously to that soul according to the place that has given to his spouse. If we give a lot of room to Our Lady, we'll receive the Holy Spirit in abundance. If we give little or no room to Our Lady, we'll receive but little or nothing of the Holy Spirit. One of the main reasons, the saint says, why the Holy Spirit does not work striking wonders in souls is that he fails to find in them a sufficiently close union with his faithful and inseparable spouse. True devotion, then, to the Holy Spirit is devotion to Our Lady. And true devotion to Our Lady is by necessity a devotion to the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit finds her, her spouse, and a soul, he hastens. He hastens there and enters into it. Back to Pope Leo XIII. When he concluded his encyclical, he reminded us that in praying to the Holy Spirit, we must turn to Our Lady as well, because she is his spouse, the Holy Father repeated. May she continue to strengthen our prayers with her suffrages, with her intercession, and in the midst of all the stress and trouble of the nations, those divine prodigies may be happily revived by the Holy Ghost, which were foretold in the words of David. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. What's one of the reasons that these divine prodigies are not renewed? One of the main reasons that the Holy Spirit does not work striking wonders in souls of the faithful is because he doesn't find a sufficient love and devotion for Our Lady in these souls. Let us then beseech Our Lady for the gift of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit may be sent to renew the face of the earth. We know that the earth, in a literal or in a metaphorical sense, has grown old and decrepit in its sins, and it needs renewal if it wants to, if it, if it, uh, if it in any way will avoid self-destruction. And only the Holy Spirit, the spirit of her lo heroic love of God, heroic love of neighbor in God and for God, only this Holy Spirit can renew it. And this renewal must start with us, not with others, but with us. It must start with our own heroic love for God. By living according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh, 
but living according to the Spirit and molding the world according to the Spirit of God and not letting ourselves be molded by the Spirit of the world. This is why we need to ask him to come, to bestow his gifts upon us. There is no better way. Rather, there is simply no other way than through Our Lady, the Immaculate Spouse of the Holy Spirit, inseparable from him. Let us pray then with the Holy Father. Let us pray then with the Church. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Our Lady, Spouse of the Holy Spirit, pray for us.